Hi, everyone. Good morning. We're going to begin. Thank you all for being here. I'm really excited to be here and continue the series. What we're going to be talking about this year, which we've been doing already for a year, is different places in Israel. Every week, I'm going to try to take you to a different place, and we're going to discover new information about places we already know, or new information about completely brand new places. And I have a few goals in this. One is to give you ideas of what you could do when you come to Israel, because something I hear all the time from people is, we already did everything, we saw everything there is. There's tons of stuff to see in Israel, and I am thrilled to give you new ideas and about things to do. And my second goal, which is a goal that I, ha I try to have in everything that I do, is the more you know about a place, the more you know about a person, the more you love them. And the more we know about Eretz Yisrael, the more we'll love it, the more we'll love God who gave us Eretz Yisrael. So I really believe, and I, I experienced this myself in learning about Eretz Yisrael, we're learning to love God even more. And that we have a mitzvah to do right there after. I'm going to share my screen with you and we will begin. This is a picture of where I got married. You could see me over here under this white canopy. This is me in my wedding dress. This, I love this photograph because it's a landscape of everything. We had this tent of a Hamavino type tent open on all sides. It was Corona, you see people wearing masks and we did everything very open. You can also see the chupa over here on the left, farm. And you also see how gorgeous it is. You look at the hills, there's a vineyard which is cut out of this picture. And if uh, normally you could see the Dead Sea like right behind these buildings. And this is the backyard of my in-laws house. This is where they lived. We got married in the backyard, which was so much fun. This is a dance floor over here. And look at the view we were looking at. They lived in a place called Penek Hedem, and I loved it. I loved going there. I loved getting married there. I loved the openness, the weather, everything about it I loved. And about a month ago, my mother and father-in-law made a 180 move, and they moved to Tel Aviv. Now, I don't love Tel Aviv. It, I know some people love it. They come to Israel. They want to be only in Tel Aviv. Tons of Israelis love it. And it's just not my top place. And to move from Pnei Kedem to Tel Aviv, wow, it's something that I need to get used to. And it's specifically because I don't love Tel Aviv that I said, duh, if you don't love Tel Aviv, that's what you're going to be speaking about because you want to love Eretz Yisrael and Tel Aviv is also part of Eretz Yisrael. And I'm sure there's things in Tel Aviv that you can learn to love and that are amazing and that you don't even know. So that was one of my goals uh, when I set out to research Tel Aviv. And unsurprisingly, I did find many cool stories and facts about it, which really is giving me a different look about it. I, as I was learning um, about Tel Aviv, I said, I right away, wanna, I want to write in my family chat all these new things that I'm learning. And I told my mother-in-law, guess what I learned about Tel Aviv? She said, tell me, because I don't know anything about it. And, and now I have this new excitement and I actually want to take two trips there because I want to see some of the things that we're going to be talking about. And I think something that's going to be, that was rewarding for me and will be for you as well, is we have in our mind and on what's portrayed on the news and the internet, certain ideas about Tel Aviv. And I want to expose this to different ones. So everyone has what, what they think of. And now we'll learn something now. So this is Tel Aviv, where they moved to. And the goals that I want to speak about this week. One, how and why was Tel Aviv founded? Two, who was Nahum Gutman and what was one of his contributions to Tel Aviv? Three, discover new sites to visit in Tel Aviv. I always love discovering new places in Israel. So those are the goals for this week. And a higher goal, which we're not going to completely answer this week, but I want us to keep in mind, is to what degree should we preserve memories and artifacts from the past? In 1906, there was a man that moved to Israel. And when he moved to Israel, he did something that none of us would ever expect to do. I want us to 
put ourselves a minute in the shoes of somebody that's flying to, to Israel, not even to move there, right? You go a 12 hour flight, you land in Israel. What do you want to do? You want to check into the hotel. You want to relax, maybe have breakfast. If you're going to go out and see the sites, depending on what hour you landed, you're going to go local. You're not about to go on a, a few day trek or do something intensive. You, you locally stay where you are. And then as you get settled in more, you, advent, you adventure out further, see what's going on in the country. Akiva Weiss, he comes to Israel uh, from Poland with his six children and his wife. And two hours after being in his house, he hears a knock on the door and he opens the door and standing there is a man that says, Akiva, come with me. We're about to go to a meeting with the men of the town that we're in. They were in Yafo, which is by the, but that's where the new Olim of Eretz Yisrael would go. It was the gateway into Israel. So he tells him, Akiva, come with me, come to the meeting. And Akiva goes. Six hours later, he comes home and he sees his wife crying hysterically. And he says, honey, what's the matter? Why are you crying? She goes, why am I crying? We landed a few hours ago in Israel, got off the boat. You disappeared. I have had no idea where you went. I don't know anyone here. I have no way to reach you, no way to call you. What if something happened to you? I'm alone with six kids. Why am I crying? And then the man, so when Akiva came home, he came home with the man that brought him to the meeting. And this man tells his wife, do you know what your husband just did at this meeting? And he tells him what he did at the meeting. And immediately she stops crying and she says, okay. And for the rest of their duration in Israel, she lets Akiva go to wherever he wants, comes and go as he pleases. So what happened at this meeting that was so fateful? Before I tell you, I want to just look on a map, what we're talking about. So we always start with Jerusalem. You travel, depending on traffic, 45 minutes, 50 minutes, an hour and a half. You get to Tel Aviv. Now notice it's Tel Aviv, Yafa. They started out as two separate cities, which we're going to discuss, but today it's merged into one. You can walk from one to another. That's uh, the, the full name. And okay, so I want to want to tell you about the meeting. So Akiva, he's in the meeting and he says, I have a great opportunity now to let these people know what my plans are. And he asks for permission to speak and they say speak. He says, I think we should start a new town. What do you mean start a new town? He says, Yafo is pretty crowded. Yafo was the town that he was in now that he arrived at. And we should start somewhere new. And not only should it be new, it should be a little bit further away from Yafo. And it should be this unique city that's modern, that has plumbing, that has pipes. And it should be the first Hebrew city in Israel. What does that mean, a Hebrew city in Israel? Well, they spoke Hebrew in Israel. There were cities established beforehand. You go to Yerushalayim, the people there know Hebrew. However, if you go to school, a child is not, going, is not learning in Hebrew. He's learning in whatever language he understands most. It's a country of immigrants. If they're coming from Europe and they speak Polish in school, they're learning in Polish. If they speak French, they're learning in French. So his idea that everything should be in Hebrew, that the workers who build the city should be Jewish and it should be only Hebrew work was very revolutionary. So they hear what he says, and right away they throw a few questions at him. They go, well, you know that it's at that point that Turks were in charge of Israel. They, the Turks make it very hard to buy land. And even once you have the land, you can't really build on it. And they have all these claims that they're telling him about things that he should know. And he calmly answers each and every one of the claims. And the meeting ends. They have a committee formed to create this new town. The committee was called Achuzat Bayit. And they all cheer and imagine this is what he does the day he moved to Israel. He starts an organization to form a new city in Israel. <laughs> so when Akiva's wife hears that this is what her husband is involved in, very brave of him and ambitious, she realizes the importance, she stops crying and he goes on with it. And that is the beginning of Tel Aviv. This picture shows us what Tel Aviv used to look like. Sand dunes. This, this was it. it. It's really hard to picture. We can picture sand if we go to the beach at Tel Aviv, but to, to take all the towers and skyscrapers and erase them and look at this picture of sand, 
this is what it looked like. And this over here is a photograph of the 66 families that were chosen by lottery. Their name was written on seashells. And they were the ones that started Tel Aviv. So they are the brave pioneers, Akiva Weiss and his family being one of them. This is the first house built in Tel Aviv. And notice well, one of the first houses, how nice it is. It, it could be a house in deal, sand, open, low, not the Tel Aviv. We know of skyscrapers and everything crowded in traffic, but this is what it used to look like. It's the house of a man named Meir Dizengoff, who we'll talk about next week. And Another unique thing I want to mention about Tel Aviv is notice over here is Yaffa. What would happen when Yaffa got very crowded, new neighborhoods would form, but the new neighborhood wanted to be an extension of Yaffa. They didn't want something completely new. So you have here Nevet Sedek is an extension. They want to be associated still. But then Akiva Weiss's idea, let's make Tel Aviv not an extension of Yaffa. Let's make it its own thing. Ironic how today it kind of is an extension because the names are merged, but that was also unique in his thinking that he wanted a brand new thing, not to be part of something old. So here are the three, the developments. Akiva Weiss and his wife, they had another child when they were in Israel. Their daughter's name was up for grabs and he wanted to name his daughter after the original name of Tel Aviv, which was Achuzat Bayit. And his wife says, no way are we naming my daughter Achuzat Bayit. They compromised on Achuzbet. Um, I, this is kind of a depressing picture that I see her memorial stone. This is what I'm putting. She was buried in a cemetery in Tel Aviv. She never got married, unfortunately. But what the point of this is Akiva Weiss was so into his project and his, and his idea that he wanted to name his daughter after the new town. And so he did. One of the things you can visit when you go to Tel Aviv is this cute quaint house over here, which is Akiva Weiss's house. And there is a plaque right over there and it attributes the founding. He was one of the people, the founding of Achuzat Bayit, which is later renamed Tel Aviv to Akiva Weiss. And we're gonna talk about um, what the name Tel Aviv means, where it got its name. But that's um, <laughs> part one. I wanna ask you if we're creating a new community, what building or social structures are important to have? What does a Jewish community need to have? If you were given that task, somebody said, you create a community, what, need, what do you need to have? A school, a shul, a social center, shops, what's important to have? I wanna share with you what Tel Aviv had. This over here is a rare picture because it's in color. But a little bit behind the trees is something known in Hebrew. I have it right on the bottom as Hagimnasia Ha'ivrit Herzliya. Hagimnasia Ha'ivrit, you could translate as gymnasium. It was a boys, it was a high school. Herzliya, named after Theodor Herzl. And this was the central building of this new town, this high school where the instruction was completely in Hebrew. Now, they thought of building a shul. They wanted to make a big grand shul. Until that happened, they would they had an Adon Kodesh and they would pray in a room on Shabbatot in this squawk. Um, and this was the first building. Now remember the building, remember the name, because you are going to see it all over the place. This building, this school has become an icon. And I think it's really special that it's a school because in Judaism, we really value education and teaching our children. And this is the epitome of school. So here is what it looks like a little bit bigger. We see students in the front and something really unique. Notice that there's these two, I'm gonna call it a pillar, two pillars in the front and notice on top this design. What does this remind you of? Well, the people that built it wanted you to be reminded of none other than the Beit HaMikdash. In the Beit HaMikdash, there were two pillars and we could read, read about this in Sefer Melachim one called Yachin and one called Boaz. And the gymnasium, the school was built to model what the Beit HaMikdash looked like. And when you see these two pillars, you should think of the Beit HaMikdash. So that also makes it a more powerful experience. You go into school and this is what you're thinking of. Here's a cute picture. We see a camel parked in front, giving people rides and notice the sand, no cars, nothing paved. 
Another unique feature of this new town that was created is the streets were named after people, which today we don't even think is a big deal. You go to Jerusalem, you have David HaMelech Street, Rachel Imenu, Shlom Sion HaMalka, everyone's named after people. But this was the, one of the first places to do it. And we, you can get an entire history lesson just from reading the names of the streets and get an education in Zionism and the start of the country. And I always have these ideas that I, I living in Jerusalem, you could do it anywhere. Why not just walk around the street names and read everything there is about a person. And it's nice how a lot of times the street names in Israel, they'll have three words explaining who the person is. So you, you get an education just walking the streets. So that was a unique feature in Tel Aviv that the street names were named after people. And another one, which we're gonna talk more about next week, uh, a side point, I opened up saying that I had this mission to learn about Tel Aviv, learn new things. I found so much amazing information that it, we're gonna have to split it because it's just too much for one week. They had a water tower which and pipes, which meant there was modern plumbing, which not all of the cities had. And that was really <laughs> special for the people, make, makes it modern and comfortable to live in. What should we call the new city? Achuzat Bayit was the original name and it was what the committee was called, but they had every intention of calling it something else. And their, uh, Theodor Herzl, he wrote a book called Oil to New Land, which in English translates as to old new land or in Hebrew, Eretz Yishana Chadasha, old new land, a man named Nachum Sokolov translated his book. He said, how do we translate old new land that the translation would be Tel Aviv. How? So Tel refers to an ancient mound. When you come to Israel, you'll see a lot of Tilim in, in plural, something ancient where you have building on top, one on top of each other, because in the ancient days, if they would want to build, they didn't have bulldozers to clear the land. They would just build on the old foundations. And Aviv means spring renewal growth. So it's a beautiful name that we are growing this city from anew. And named Tel Aviv is even more beautiful. If you know the one place in Tanakh where Tel Aviv is mentioned, yes, it's surprising that it is. No, it is not referring to this Tel Aviv in Israel, it's referring to something else, but it's definitely a play off of it. In Sefer Yechezkel, Yechezkel says he goes to the Gola, he goes to the Galut, Tel Aviv, which is a place by the river, and he's sitting there, now, Tel Aviv is a place in Babel. Babel, Babylon is in exile. And now they're using that name for this new city in Israel. So it's reversed. Instead of it being a place in exile, it's a place of growth and renewal and new opportunities, new people. And that's, it has also that, that connection to it and all of the hopes that people wanted in Tel Aviv. I think if the founders of Tel Aviv could see today, they, <laughs> they would be blown away from what, what it became some statistics of why they'd be so blown away. So 1909, we started out with 66 families and notice the growth, 2,000, 46,000, 350,000. Next week, when we're gonna talk a little bit about the mayor that was so successful in this population growth. And today there's about half a million residents in Tel Aviv. It's the second biggest city in Israel, the biggest being Jerusalem with about 800,000. And the numbers are always changing, but around. Just a mini summary, we said Tel Aviv was founded in 1909 by 66 families, had a Hebrew school, unique street names, a water tower and pipes, a huge population growth <laughs> over time. Now, where is this beautiful and historic building today? I told you to keep in mind because we're gonna see it everywhere. This beautiful and historic building today, what happened to it? Well, the city spreads northward and in 1959, 50 years after celebrating the founding of Tel Aviv, the people say, hey, this city is expanding. Who needs this old building? We don't need it anymore. And the building was destroyed, gone, just a memory. This first structure that they have, a school, two pillars, Yachin and Boaz, destroyed because they said, who needs it? Nowadays, they would never destroy something like that, but there was not the awareness of preservation and keeping something historic around that we have today in the 80s, it was developed. 
And this connects to one of the questions I said to keep in mind about to what degree do we preserve the past slash look forward. In its place, what they built was the first skyscraper in Israel called Migdal Shalom. And if you go to Migdal Shalom today, know that you're standing in the exact place where this first Hebrew school used to stand. This is what, re what replaced it. And today people say, how could they destroy such a historic building? So I already answered it and said, they just didn't have that kind of awareness that things should be preserved. In the eighties, they founded this organization, which if you walk around any really most cities in Israel, a lot of times on the building, you'll see this plaque and a symbol. And the, the organization is called Hamatzal Shimur Atarim, which is the council for preserving historic heritage buildings. And a lot of times when there's the building that the city wants to destroy, why do they want to destroy it? It's taking up great real estate. Uh, I live in Israel in Kiryat Moshe in Jerusalem. And there's a bakery near where I live with the factories it's called Angel Bakery it has been around for <laughs> hundreds of years since the founding, not hundreds, but before the founding of the state, it was around. And Angel Bakery decided that they want to sell their land in Jerusalem and move to someone else, somewhere else because Jerusalem is such great real estate and you get so much money for every little piece. And they say, why do we, we don't need to be here. We're a bakery, we could be anywhere else. And they made tons and tons and tons of money of, on their piece of land. Now this Mu'atzal al Tarim says, you wanna destroy this historic building because you wanna make money. But this is so historic and it has national importance and significance and we don't want you to destroy it. And this organization, they gather together all the people that they can and all the money that they can to stop it. And you'll see all over Israel buildings that things to this organization were preserved. What does the organization use as its symbol? This building should be familiar to you. Hagimnasia Hayyudit Herzliya. They use the building that they destroyed and then regretted that they destroyed as a symbol of what we need to do, what we need to be. So in, in a way, even though the physical building was destroyed, it actually was really, really preserved because if this was the symbol, if this is the symbol of this organization and it's everywhere, a little Googling as to what it is, you, you think immediately of what it is. So this is the school and it looks exactly like the school. And soon after they destroyed the school, they approached this, man named Nachum Gutman and they and Nachum Gutman was an artist and they say can you please help us we destroyed something so historic and we want to remember it we want to know that it exists we want to remember the beginnings of Tel Aviv can you help us and as an artist he helps them and what does he do he creates this beautiful beautiful mosaic I saw this once in my tour garden course when we learned about it after learning about it and after what I'm going to teach you, I want to go to Tel Aviv right now to go look at the mosaic in person. Because first of all, from this picture, you can see how big it is and how grand it is. And especially if you know the story of Tel Aviv, and I'm going to throw in a few more details about its founding as we go on, you go in and you appreciate it. This mosaic is in Migdal Shalom, the tall tower which replaced the school. And it's great to know about because if it's raining out, if it's too hot out, it's great for any weather, it's indoors, it's free, it's on the bottom floor. And it, it's also fun for kids. If you know how to engage them the right way, you could do uh, scavenger hunts, who could find this, who could find that, and you get a great education. So this is something, if you're in Tel Aviv and you have extra time or you want this to be your stop, it's a great thing to go and visit. So this is another zoomed in picture of his mosaic. We're gonna focus on a few parts of it, just some highlights. Some points, it's made of more than a million stones and they're mostly not stones. It's colored glass, as opposed to a lot of mosaic, all the mosaics that you find from ancient shuls in Israel are made of actual stones. But here, modern day, doesn't all have to be stone colored glass. It was, the sketches were done in Israel by Nachum Gutman, but the actual work was done in Italy. And they brought it over in four different sections around 1964 is when he designed finished it. I love this uh, view of it. You see either the stones or the colored glass. And his goal was to talk about the, the founding of Tel Aviv. Now, the first section, the, every section has a dominant color. 
The dominant color is green. And what does Nachum Gutman want to focus on? That before there was Tel Aviv, there was Yaffa and the port and the boats. And east of that were the orchards. And we started out very green and very natural. And for anyone familiar with Nachum Gutman's drawings, this is one of his pictures. He has the orchards of Yaffa. And that's what he wants people to start with. First off, before we even get to Tel Aviv, we have orange orchards, we have Yaffa, we have the port, we have the city. The next section, the dominant color is yellow. Yellow reminds us of the hot sun beating down on their backs and of the sand dunes. The Olim are coming through the port straight to the sand dunes and nothing grows there except there is a sycamore tree that grows and we'll um, see it in a few slides. And this question that I have there on the bottom, you guys can answer. They come and they build on the sand. What is their main building? What does Nachum Gutman make sure to stress? The Hebrew gymnasium when he's making pictures and houses and a water pipe as well. So here is this yellow is the sand. Here is the sycamore tree. And this is part of his second section. It's a little bit blurry this one, but you can still make it out. Here is the school, Gymnasia Haivrit Herzliya, and around are the houses that the people built. And you see some camels here, very deserty kind of feel. Tel Aviv, there's nothing built yet, but the people are working hard. The third section, the dominant color is red, and the red represents doing and action. In the 1920s, there was something known as the fourth Aliyah, and Jews from Poland come with money. And they wanna live in a city, they wanna live in a place of action, and they go to Tel Aviv, and there's a big boom, and that's the color red that's represented. And they build more and more and more houses and the city is growing. And the, uh, on the actual mosaic, you could see people mixing the cement. Something that I wanna, here's the red section. I wanna zoom in now. Uh, here's a water tower. We mentioned that that was something they had in the city. People working. I wanna zoom in on something which I think is beautiful. So here is a picture of three people pushing a wheelbarrow. Notice that this man, he's completely red. This one is wearing a shirt, he's white skin and his nose is red. And this one over here, he also doesn't have a shirt, but he's white and then his neck and his hands are red. What do they represent? Well, the first one is a guy that's been in Tel Aviv a really long time. And because he's been in Tel Aviv a really long time, his body is red from the sun. The third guy is someone who's been to Tel Aviv, but he hasn't been here that long and he, he didn't have time to get burnt all over his body. And the middle guy is someone that just stepped off the boat, just got off the port, and he's still white, he's still wearing his Russian shirt. And what Nahum Gutman wants to represent in this section of pushing the wheelbarrow is the building of Tel Aviv was a team effort. Everyone got involved, everyone participated. The person who's been here a long time and the person that just came off the boat yesterday. And that's really, I think, a unique feature of the city that everyone is involved and everyone is together. Here's a, another picture of it, more of a <laughs> bigger view. And in the fourth section, there is no dominant color. Tel Aviv is already a big city, sky skyscrapers, the airport. And what Nahum Gutman wants to impress upon us in the fourth slide is that no matter how big the city gets, it will always have its unique personality. The colors are a bit faded in the fourth slide. And in the middle of this fourth section, and I know we're not exactly looking at it, but <laughs> hopefully you want to come to Israel and see it and see everything we're discussing. In the middle of the fourth section, he has this yellow eye. And what is the center of the eye? I told you to remember the school because it comes up again and again and again. The first school, all speaking Hebrew school in Israel. And you see here the streets with the street names that I mentioned. This is the center. This is what the people are remembering, their foundation. Notice here the skyscrapers, the buildings, the windows. And here's another view of it. It's really pretty. It's so impressive mosaics and you know, from close, from far. Another view, here's the eye. Now to summarize. So I started out the class talking about my in-laws moving to Tel Aviv and how that was hard for me. But I said, Tel Aviv is also Edith Israel. So learn, learn more about it and you'll learn to love it. And, I already do just from learning this, and especially what I'm gonna share with you next week, this was mind blowing for me to learn about. 
we spoke about Akiva Weiss and how his first night in Israel, he leaves to go join a meeting and he says, I have an idea, let's build a new city. And he named his daughter after the new city. That's how into it he was. And today in Tel Aviv, today you can go and see his house. So that's something else you could add to your list of things to do, go see his house. And seeing his house, other than it being cool to see his house, you can have then talk about Akiva Weiss and his story and what he did with himself and all these conversations about people and that start things and go on new initiatives. I think it's inspiration for our own life and what we do and leads us to question things. So that's why I like learning about these historic people. We discussed the 66 families that started Tel Aviv, how they made the first Hebrew school. This was really important to them. They had a water tower and pipes and I want to mention that Nahum Gutman writes about the pipes in his book. He said they, they broke all the time and water, water would squirt out, but then it would bring songbirds, songbirds that would come to the pipes and drink from the water. So he found a way to even make that something positive and pretty. So the street names are named after people. The name Tel Aviv, which is based on the translation of Herzl's book and also mentioned in Sefer Yechazkel. Migdal Shalom, which was the first skyscraper in Israel built in the exact spot where the Hebrew school stood. And we ended with Nahum Gutman's mosaic, which is in Migdal Shalom, which talks about the founding of Tel Aviv and the story. So this entire story that I told you, you can go to this mosaic and just look at it. And just looking at the mosaic, you get the story and it's nice to get it in a visual way. Another question I posed to you was, to what degree should we preserve memories and artifacts from the past? So that is something that Israel struggles with as a country, but I'd say on a more personal level, maybe we in our, our life don't have actual buildings that we're preserving and destroying, but we have certain memories. What do we choose to remember? What do we choose to let go of different mementos we get from our parents? Do we want to keep it? Do we want to throw it out? Even our own things. I still have my report cards from first grade. Truth is, it's in my mother's house stored. I don't want it, but like, am I keeping it? Am I getting rid of it? So this question, we're going to answer more. Next week, we are going to continue talking about Tel Aviv. And I want to tell you about other mind-blowing things that I, I learned. Um, I, I didn't want to overload, so we're going to save it for next week. Thank you all for being here. As always, it is a pleasure. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer. Otherwise, I will see you next week.